Hi, I'm Pat Kung, and this is the latest in my series of mostly unplanned, mostly unscripted uh, philosophy videos. Um, for today's episode, I've been thinking a bit about Sigmund Freud. Um, he's known as having founded uh, the School of Psychoanalysis, which was an early, uh, I guess early is kind of a complicated word when it comes to something philosophical or even scientific. But he, uh, he was an early psychologist who was kind of in the era when psychology was transitioning from being a pseudoscience into a proper science. And he, he performed experiments, which was relatively novel in psychology, not completely novel, but relatively novel. But he also still had some of the, the old um, uh, psychological spirit of aiming for grand narratives of how people think. Modern psychology, because it's been more or less made into a science, it tends not to address the, the bigger questions because we don't have the data yet to do that properly. But we have lost some of the ability to really talk about big issues, except in, in a more uh, limited extent in, uh, in philosophy. Um, and like many uh, scientists of that era, uh, Freud was a polymath. He had an interest in a number of different uh, topics of human existence. And he wrote two books, one of which was Future of an Illusion, which discussed uh, the, uh, the role of religion in society. And uh, the other is Civilization and its Discontents. The second one is most interesting for this video. Uh, civilization and, uh, and its discontents lays out the idea that being that that being in a modern society is difficult for people because uh, the environment in which we evolved, in which primitive hum uh, primitive humans lived and predecessors to humans lived, it was much more emotionally easy in some ways uh, because we didn't really try to have the high standards of living so close to each other, of trying to be just, to be fair, to have all of these modern attributes that, that we're now trying to do. And, and so, yeah, the, the ancient world or the, the pre-civilization world, it may have been brutal and unpleasant, but it was probably closer to our nature. Um, so that basically you, you would probably say that, that Freud had a relatively negative view of, of how humans naturally are. Uh, he, he probably thought of uh, pre-civilization life as nasty, brutish, and short, to, to borrow the, uh, the classic uh, phrase. And, um, and in trying to pull back from excessively self-centered uh, goals, we've brought things into our psyche, uh, these types of restraints. And these restraints are difficult for us. They're telling us, don't maximally serve your interests. Don't, uh, don't exercise power just because you have it. Um, don't, uh, don't always go through life uh, only looking out for number one. And he, he thought that there was a psychic cost to this. Now, Freud thought that this cost was worth paying, uh, but he he did see it as a cost, and uh, and that distance creates a certain type of low-grade stress of, uh, over a civilization. Um, so the reason that I, I opened this video with uh, with that is that I wanted to talk about catharsis. Uh, catharsis is related to this in that it's when people uh, act in a conversation or uh, or make proclamations to the world that are uh, intellectually um, self-praising, praising oneself, praising one's views, uh, doing the easy thing for that little rush of release, that uh, that feeling of lack of tension. Now, that it, catharsis isn't the only instance of that. Like, one of the functions of comedy in society is to, uh, is to act as a release for that bottled upness that, uh, that if, if Freud was right, 
And I think I think Freud uh, was significantly onto something in civilization and its discontent. So if Freud was right, then we should probably consider comedy a release for some of that stress. Uh, another way to release that stress, though, is to say the fun, uh, fun but sloppy things in uh, in favor of ourselves, like I'm the best, or my views are absolutely right, or the people who oppose me are monsters. Uh, dehumanization is uh, it's not it's presumably not only caused by catharsis, but it's certainly one um, one plausible cause for it. And so. What I generally suggest to people is that they try to be wary of catharsis. Uh, keep it under control. Um, it's probably impossible to eliminate it entirely. And this, uh, it's also probably socially damaging to uh, limit it too much, and that a lot of the ways that people relate to each other, unfortunately, is making these fun statements or by finding other people who think identically to, date, uh, to the way that they do. Uh, some people have an unusual upbringing and that feature is mostly absent in them. But I think most people are most comfortable with uh, others who believe similarly to the way that they do, uh, who talk uh, similarly, who, uh, who occasionally will say those fun things uh, friendships are often built out of uh, out of shared dislikes of other people, and losing out entirely on that is a rough thing to ask of anyone. But at the same time, catharsis is is dangerous in a lot of ways. Like, let's take for example, if you're part of uh, part of a group with a particular uh, set of political ideas. Or, or a group with a particular set of religious ideas, um, you're always going to be tempted, particularly if you're trying to convert them and they're trying to convert you and you have constant sparring over politics and current events, things like that. You're going to be very tempted to say things like, the people on the other side uh, are awful, they must live hateful lives, um, and... Uh, and so you're going to probably uh, ignore, you're going to lose sight of their humanity. You're going to forget that uh, whatever their religion, whatever their political philosophy, they are going to probably have mostly the same flavor of life that, that, uh, that you do. Um, they'll, they'll be born, they'll have a, a rough childhood, they're uh, possibly uh, caring parents who are struggling to be good parents. Um, They'll have a complicated issue with uh, in their in their teens. They'll eventually reach adulthood. They'll have a little bit of resentment initially towards their parents and towards any authority, and eventually that'll fade. And they'll slowly become vested in society. They'll move through several political philosophies. Maybe they'll meet somebody. They might have kids. They might adopt kids. Uh, maybe they'll never uh, never have kids. Maybe they'll never meet someone. And they'll grow old, and they'll uh, and if they have kids, they'll they'll raise them. If not, then uh, they'll still grow old and die, just like anyone else. And this is this pattern. It's it's human. It describes basically our enti uh, our entire species. Everyone from the Taliban uh, or Talibanis to Americans to medieval uh, Euro uh, Europeans to uh, I mean it. It's one of those cycles that never ends, and it binds every human. And we easily lose sight of that. We forget how much is invested into every human being by the time they reach adulthood or over the rest of their life. And, but we're willing to lose sight of that for the sake of uh, dealing with that frustration we have when other people don't share our views, when other people are different religiously, Politically, um, or sometimes uh, some some people care a lot more about uh, race, and they might feel frustrated if uh, if they see their neighborhood um, filling with people that don't look like them, that don't talk like them, and uh, and so on. And so they get paranoid, and so they'll 
they'll lose sight of the humanity of, uh, of, of people who just differ a little bit and, um, and treat them as, as if they're not human. So catharsis isn't just about speech. Uh, it's, it's most visible with speech. And I, I would advise that, that people be wary of making uh, statements that are too cathartic, uh, of seeking catharsis too much. Um, but they should also be aware of when others are doing it. And in general, I, I, would, uh, I would hope that we can find ways to pull people out of catharsis speaking discourse into more, more careful discourse. Um, this, this won't always prevent a disagreement, but it will lead to better dialogue and it won't lead to as much uh, demonization uh, of each other. Um, so we, we do this as, as a matter of, of personal virtue. We avoid, like, if somebody disagrees with us, we avoid responding with, uh, with an insult, we, even if we know that we'll never agree with them, we can either politely say that, uh, say that, or we can spar with them a little bit. And friendly sparring is a really good habit for somebody who's interested in discourse. Uh, if if you want to deal with with issues, and if if you want to live in a society where not everyone agrees with you on something, even things that are really important to you, uh, being in the habit of of having friendly sparring with people who disagree will keep you sharp. It'll potentially expose you, uh, expose you to new arguments. Occasionally you might change your mind, but that shouldn't be the most terrible thing in the world. Um, and generally I think we should trust, um, trust ourselves to be fair enough that if, if we are really convinced by somebody, um, then maybe that's the right way for our opinions to be shaped. Uh, we should keep exposing ourselves to new arguments and uh, we should see the arguments as being an opportunity to understand a different perspective rather than necessarily I'm trying to humiliate somebody. Um, so pulling back from instinct, that's uh, very similar to pulling back from catharsis. Um, and so the way that this ties into uh, uh, the way that this ties into Freud is that we recognize that everybody if they're going to be engaged in responsible discourse they hopefully will be trying to pull back from catharsis and we should we should not go to them into catharsis we shouldn't try to uh, engage with them emotionally uh, on issues, which isn't to say that, we, uh, that emotions have no place in philosophy. They do. But uh, our emotions and our intellectual aesthetic should go into finding our axioms, uh, the, the things at the root of our philosophy. Or if you prefer not to use the word axiom, uh, just our roots. Um, but we shouldn't be uh, that doesn't mean that in, unless we've actually gotten into a discussion where we're getting down to our roots and making raw aesthetic appeals after we acknowledge that um, that we're talking axiomatically and we're beyond the areas where uh, reason can easily lead us into particular uh, value conclusions. Once once we've gotten beyond that then yeah, we, we can talk about our emotions, we can talk about our commitments and how we were raised and why it's, it might be prettier or more interesting to believe a certain way. But that's very different from, uh, from having a discussion on a relatively evolved high-level uh, philosophical conclusion. Um, like take for example abortion. Uh, abortion is a very tricky topic. It's one where my, my views have changed a lot over the years. Um, I'm almost 35 now. And my views have, have shifted very significantly from uh, probably about early college until uh, maybe four or five years ago when I was, uh, when I was about 30. And, uh, and I'm not ashamed of that shift. 
but if I were to argue for my position, I would be making broad assertions that are not designed particularly or only to support my conclusion on the matter. Uh, I'm aiming for a type of consistency in how I uh, approach philosophical topics. And, uh, and that consistency means that there's a certain difference between my conclusions and how I tend to think about the issues. And so if, if, uh, if I'm having a conversation with somebody about abortion, um, I can draw in my thoughts on related matters, or at least matters that I see as related based on how I think about the issues. And, other, and I can ask other people how they think about, uh, about these other issues. And we can see, are they being cons uh, consistent? Am I being consistent? Am I just missing out on an argument? Or maybe is there a different foundation that explains most of my views but suggests that I have a view that's not really congruent with the rest? That's the kind of conversation that we should be having. Uh, rather than figuring out a way to cleverly insult somebody uh, throughout the in entire discussion, um, we shouldn't be looking for the little making ourselves feel good throughout the conversation. Um, we should uh, we should just generally approach discourse, and we should generally try to to, uh, to think internally in a way that's not so self-flattering. Uh, bringing the ego out of um, uh, out of uh, conversations, out of behavior, um, not doing a little victory dance if somebody stomps off uh, in a conversation, and to try try not to be the cause of somebody stomping off. These are ways in which uh, which we can avoid too much catharsis. Now, there are times when. Uh, maybe a little bit of catharsis is okay, feeling relieved that, uh, that a conversation didn't go, uh, didn't go on further, uh, feeling a certain amount of comfort in uh, having fended off an attack in conversation, uh, things, things like that. But, uh, but there are some types of catharsis that we should never seek. Uh, ideally the dehumanizing kind. Even if we were making harsh conclusions that leaves, uh, that mean that somebody is not going to be ever happy, we still aren't going to be trying to make them angry. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's just categorically different from, uh, some of the mild, milder forms of catharsis that we might need to, to feel emotionally comfortable uh, to uh, just to, to get by. But uh, so there's there's a kind of stoicism here that that we're trying to balance between uh, we're trying to balance between a, a kind of stoicism and a kind of uh, egoism. And uh, balance is probably not quite the right word because we're not aiming for anything like a middle. I am suggesting that we should probably lean towards stoicism, even if stoicism, even if stoicism versus egoism isn't necessarily the only way to think about, uh, or even the best way to think about uh, what we're aiming for. It's a reasonable first shot. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, I'm hoping that uh, that this concept is clear, uh, and that it'll. It'll be helpful to look for uh, catharsis-seeking uh, catharsis arguments in yourself and other, and catharsis-seeking behavior. And also maybe that uh, when somebody does seem to be living in a world where they're mostly seeking catharsis and argument, even if uh, even if hopefully I've shown that that it's not uh, not a good thing, it's an understandable thing. Um, we are creatures with emotional needs. Uh, we are uh, apes that have developed some of the habits of civilization, but they don't come easy to us. And when people fail in those habits, it doesn't make them uh, a monster. So we should be uh, trying not to have too much catharsis, even over people who engage in catharsis-seeking uh, behavior. But we can probably nudge them in a way uh, uh, to help them see it and then to help them control it. 
So uh, that's the end of uh, the video. If you have any questions or comments, I welcome them.